Well, welcome everybody. Uh, Thank you for joining us and thank you for your patience there as we uh, just started to get everything uh, up and going from a technology standpoint. But, uh, but thanks for joining us as we continue to unravel the economic impacts of the pandemic on the third quarter spending, uh, spending patterns and retail performance. Um, but also we'll be leading into uh, a lot of our assumptions of uh, future, the future of sales tax trends. As many of you know, I'm Bobby Young. Uh, both Brett Plumley and I are principals with HDL Sales Tax, helping provide quarterly updates and forecasts for our clients here in California. At HDL, <clears throat> and uh, next slide there. There we go. Uh, at HDL, we continue to benefit from the strength of our client base and therefore our ability to capture about 98% of the statewide data. This provides us the actual data to follow the trends, uh, both now and from prior recessions and recovery periods. We maintain this data, both by industry and agency, to customize forecast and give a clear picture to all of our clients. We currently have a strong team of 11 principals. All of us are former local government leaders and additional staff members who contribute, <coughs> excuse me, contribute relevant analytics and follow real-time trends that enhance the overall forecast that we'll be talking about today. So all of us have experienced nine and a half months of COVID, which has had a devastating impact both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. Thankfully, we're now closer to a vaccine being available on a larger scale, which many acknowledge is needed to eventually fully reopen the economy again. So you'll hear us reference that uh, throughout this presentation, just because it is going to be so monumental for us. As we proceed through the presentation, uh, please send us in your question using the uh, Q&A box. If you, uh, if you hover over your screen, you'll see a, uh, a little um, link there that says uh, Q&A. Uh, it's like a little question mark inside of a couple of text boxes uh, for you to open up that section and submit a, uh, a question for us. At the very end, we'll have a whole Q&A session that uh, we'll be addressing those specifically. Also, for the most part, you should be muted for this presentation uh, just to help uh, keep the, uh, the audio very clear. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, what you see here, uh, oh, also as a reminder, all of the amounts and percentages that are shown throughout the presentation are, are on what we refer to as an adjusted basis. And this is where we've placed data to the period it should have been shown rather than where it was actually received. And this process really helps us see a truer trend of what's going on in the economy. Here on the screen, you'll see a quick recap at the very top for fiscal year 1920 and where we ended. Uh, last quarter with the second quarter results at down 2.7% compared to the prior year. As many of us acknowledge, it was the direct result of that first shelter in place directive back in March and uh, the entire impacts through the April, May and June uh, sales period. Later, Brett will be going through more details on how AB 147 and marketplace facilitator reporting, uh, which began in the fourth quarter 2019, really brought in large amounts of new tax revenue that helped soften those COVID impacts. Here you also see our updated statewide forecast for the coming fiscal years uh, with 2021 at 2.1% and 21-22 at a much stronger 7.5%. Um, in general, while the COVID vaccine is helping us help lift our spirits and give us hope, uh, our economy <clears throat> Our anticipation is the distribution will take some time uh, and that uh, the reopening of the economy may not happen until the summer period here in 2021 and late fall. Uh, this is why we only anticipate a softer rebound in 21-22 with, uh, with that more dramatic growth there in 21-22. Uh, you can see also uh, on that that uh, we had continued growth uh, in the out years as Again, more pieces of the economy uh, take hold and begin to reopen. Um, keep in mind as we go through also the, uh, the percentages you see will differ for your agency depending on your sales tax demographic and your prior pandemic impacts. Uh, so whether that rebounds a little bit stronger or um, just a little bit more steady. 
On this slide here, the breakdown of ma by the major industry groups, you'll see how fiscal year 1920 compares to our forecast for 2021. Um, it is um, 1920 is the green solid green lines, and you can see both for the pools and the general consumer goods categories, uh, both represented about 18 percent uh, individually, 18 percent of the total sales tax re received for 1920. Um, it is the second quarter where we see, uh, or sorry, the pools. It's the first year where we see the pools. Um, outpace general consumer goods as a category. So that's a, uh, a dynamic impact. And again, we'll kind of see um, as we talk with clients throughout this quarter's delivery, how much, um, how strong the pools have been compared to every other category. Um, also, we do anticipate solid gro continued growth for pools. Think online shopping here as general consumer goods and brick and mortar stores uh, continue to slowly reopen. Autos and transportation is the third largest group. It ended up generating about 16% of the 1920 uh, fiscal year revenue. And the lowest uh, group or the smallest group is food and drugs down there at the bottom at only uh, about 6% of the overall statewide revenue. So next slide. There we go. Um, here's breakdown uh, by quarter, right? So at the very top, <clears throat> we, uh, we included historical quarters here just as a matter of perspective to really kind of see where we've been and where we've come through uh, in comparison with, uh, with our forecast. As you see, uh, for the first quarter 2020, which is when we saw the impacts initially, um, we, only saw, we saw about a 1% drop overall statewide much greater impacts in 2Q being down 17%. Uh, we kind of all acknowledge that, but what you'll see on the screen there is third quarter um, only being down 0.9% on an adjusted basis. Uh, really caught us by surprise, um, given that uh, not all businesses were reopened, restaurants were still impacted, and we'll talk more specifically about those uh, throughout. But uh, we were fully anticipating about an 8% drop when we put the forecast together just last quarter uh, for the third quarter. So I think, and, and we've all kind of sat around the table, really feel this illustrate helps illustrate the resiliency within the California spending economy and how the ability of online retail channels has helped us as consumers and thereby help generate sales tax revenues for your local agencies. Uh, you also see the forecast by quarter going forward, where now, um, in combination with these third quarter results that uh, that we saw, we um, we know that more businesses are continuing to reopen, um, and by all accounts, from what we've heard on a more general basis, we um, we have heard that the holiday shopping period was still good, not necessarily great. Uh, probably could have been uh, better if other events might have happened uh, during that period. But uh, but we are anticipating uh, solid growth there of 6.7% in 4Q20. Um, going back to more of a modest 0.7% gain in 1Q21, a few different factors going into that. Um, one most notably, as you look at the trend of the line uh, below there, it, uh, it really speaks to the seasonal effect that we have in sales tax, where just about every bottom point ends up being the first quarter of that calendar year. And um, so first quarter, we expect to not grow quite as strong. And then the growth that you see there in the second and third quarter really kind of speaks to uh, one, a rebound from the prior year there, especially on 2Q20, being down 17%, well, now we're going to have a rebound effect um, and come come back out of that a little bit. <clears throat> then continued growth through that summer and fall period there, 6.4% in 3Q, 9.7% in 4Q. So um, again, we've got some uh, level of optimism now with uh, the results that we saw in third quarter, plus what we know so far out of the fourth quarter, especially the availability, the coming availability of uh, of the vaccine. 
On the next slide, um, kind of separating those results, right? So the that first one you saw was kind of all in. Um, here, what we're breaking apart is specifically just the place of sale uh, portion of the sales tax revenue base. So really kind of thinking um, your local businesses, um, brick and mortar stores, auto dealerships, building and construction, all that um, separated from the online piece and uh, and e-commerce, which uh, which we know has had a dramatic impact. So here we see one Q down 5%, two Q down 25%, uh, three Q still down 8%. So we saw statewide results at just one, about 1% 1 down. Um, we know place of sale was about 8%. So uh, they're online kind of making up that gap. <clears throat> What you see out of fourth quarter and first quarter is really where we anticipate still those impacts. Businesses weren't completely back up and we recognize that restaurants not as much available indoor dining, if any, uh, for some local jurisdictions. So still anticipating stronger uh, um, decreases in 4Q and 1Q out of our local businesses. But then once we hit the summer months, it's that same story where a, uh, a vaccine in place at that time, more businesses reopening us, hopefully as consumers feeling more confident and comfortable uh, being out and about, um, largely contributing to that growth. Hopefully then by the time we hit like fall period into the winter of 21, even as we look out into 21, 22, um, is the return hopefully of tourism and travel and um, and that extra discretionary spending that uh, that may happen, which uh, did not happen nearly as much here in 2020 or there in 2020. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brett to uh, to really focus on our individual major industry groups, starting with autos and transportation. So. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. And um, Bobby's given an overview of the entire state. And now we're going to drill down and tell the story about each of the seven major industry groups and the pool and starting with autos and transportation. So what we're going to do is focus in on the performance of fiscal year 1920, the actual, and then the quarter that we're analyzing that we'll be meeting with each of you this quarter third quarter 20, the projection and the actual. And in most cases, most of the industry groups, as Bobby highlighted statewide, individual industry groups have performed better than what we had originally forecast. And that has continued through COVID, through the three quarters that we're now analyzing and on into the fourth quarter. And we'll talk about as we go forward into first quarter 21 and, and future quarters. But for autos and transportation, this is an example of an industry that has done better than what we had originally forecast when COVID first struck. The COVID hit in the middle of March, so we're talking about one sixth of that first quarter 20, and the full brunt of COVID was in second quarter 20, where the shelter in place was instilled and that everyone was in their homes primarily through the end of May and that really significantly hit the second quarter. So we were having a really good fiscal year. The economy was rolling along very strongly prior to COVID hitting and first quarter and second quarter had such an impact. Autos and transportation really negatively hit and overall fiscal year 1920 down 7.2% and it has improved more than what we had forecast through COVID. So Third quarter 20, we had forecast a 5% drop and the actual came out positive for the quarter, which is a very good thing, especially in, in your agencies where you have a significant portion represented in autos and transportation. It's the third biggest major industry group um, statewide, as Bobby mentioned, and individually it just varies depending on the agency. So some of the reasons that we've been talking about now for three quarters and, and that is still the same factors are applicable for the industry group doing better than projected. Higher income consumers, primarily those that had not lost their jobs and they're staying home, they have more discretionary income and they're making and have been making one-time purchases 
that have helped insulate cities from the other really pretty significant decreases in some of the other major industry groups. So discretionary income meant some of the new motor vehicle dealers that were they were offering incentives and that coupled with the higher income consumers going out and purchasing vehicles in that first quarter and that second quarter and that has continued on their lifestyles have not changed um, you know lifestyles have changed but their livelihoods have not changed necessarily so a lot of one-time purchases also the average price we talked about it in the second quarter of a new motor vehicle went to the highest level that it's ever been at 35,000. And that has continued to go up since that time, since the second quarter. So October and November of 2020, prices have gone up even higher, 3.1% in October and 4.7% in November. And the other factor that has contributed positively to autos and transportation, at least in terms of our forecast versus the actual results. The pandemic has changed kind of the way the psyche and the way people um, spend their lifetime in, in, the, in the public and they're not going out and spending time with mass transit and ride sharing services and buses and trying to stay at home more and that has been a factor as well. In terms of retail sales, national retail auto sales, it struggled early in the pandemic and there has been and was a relatively sharp rebound that started in May. And after that time period in May, we continued to see increases in auto sales. September was up 8%, October was up 7% and preliminary results that we have for November are 3% increase and in positive year over year growth. So if we can go to the next one, this one shows the haves and haves nots through the pandemic and kind of what we have learned. And some of the segments within the auto group that are considered the haves and each community should understand your own individual strengths and weaknesses, but the haves are positive growth in terms of directly correlated to what I mentioned, more discretionary income less things to do and more desire to buy now and kind of a now or never type of mentality that happened initially through COVID, especially in that first quarter and on into the second quarter. So spending patterns have changed during COVID and in some cases it's been positive and helped to offset the overall declines. On the have not side, which is the opposite case, consumers, at least in terms of autos and transportation, this industry, they've cared less about safety less about fuel efficiency and practicality and gone out and, and made the purchases. The retail brick and mortar establishments initially when the pandemic struck were caught off guard and unprepared. So that also fits into the have not category. And in terms of the outlook for this industry group, we have seen a bounce back this quarter and a v-shaped recovery and positive results for the first time since the pandemic began which is good news and i mentioned more discretionary income more savings less things to do less eating out and shopping out fear of the virus has kept people from traveling and mass transit and we have continued to see the average price of the new vehicles go up Record low interest rates have been a contributing factor as well. Auto loan rates are down. Mortgage rates especially have been down, which has helped stimulate the economy. And federal stimulus happened early in the pandemic. We've recently seen a second wave of stimulus at the end of the calendar year, December in 2020 and the beginning of this calendar year just approved. There's also been a shift in consumer habits. So those of you, your agencies where you see you have RVs and boats and a significant portion of sales in those particular business types within autos and transportation, you have benefited. And I call that insulation again. So there are quite a few categories within the pandemic that we refer to as your particular agency being insulated from COVID-19. and. RVs have definitely be one of them and boats and motorcycles, niche vehicle sales, all of those very strong and helping to offset the overall decline in the industry group. 
fleet sales have been weak and they're going to take longer to recover. And full recovery in this industry is anticipated in fiscal year 21-22. And when we talk about full recovery, we are comparing fiscal year 18-19 as kind of the benchmark year. So we're looking at the cash levels in each of the major industry groups. And that was pre-COVID and the economy was going strong. We had not forecast a recession anytime in the next 18 to 24 months and then COVID struck. But 18, 19, we're using that as a benchmark year. So when we talk about full recovery as we go forward in this presentation in each of the industry groups, think of benchmark being 18, 19, and how long does it take the cash in that particular industry group to get back to that level? And for this autos and transportation, it's 21, 22. So we'll go on now to the next industry group, building and construction. And we have good news to report here. And when Bobby talks later in the presentation, food and drugs is another industry group that has stabilized much more quickly than most of the other groups with the exception of the pool when we get to that positive story. Building and construction, the actual fiscal year 1920 ended at a 0.2% overall increase. And so we, even in the midst of COVID and the virus hitting in the first quarter of 19 and really hitting strongly in the second quarter of, of 20, the first two quarters, that's included in there and we still saw flat growth for the entire fiscal year building and construction. And this industry group has recovered the, the most quickly and has gotten back to 18, 19 levels in fiscal year 19, 20. The projection in third quarter 20 was for a 4% increase and the actual that we're gonna talk about when we meet with you guys, but statewide, the actual was 6.4% growth. So better than anticipated stabilization in the industry. And we have forecast a 5% growth, annual growth all the way out to fiscal year 25, 26. So positive, especially for those of your agencies where they make up a, a bigger percentage of your budget. Some of the reasons for the industry doing better than what we originally forecast, home improvement spending was has been sparked by the pandemic and we expect that to continue on into the fourth quarter of 2020, but we don't expect it to match the second quarter and third quarter levels. Retail sales from building materials, we talk about this individually when we meet with you, those of you that have those types of businesses in building materials, which is a business type in building and construction, that category has done really well with the fix it up type projects that people are doing from their homes. And it was up 16% by itself in third quarter 20. So it's really helping to improve the overall performance of this sector. Suburbs are expected to see strong demand for new housing sales. And while permit values were down 22% in 2020 for the entire calendar year, this was mainly concentrated in new alteration and addition permits. And at the same time, single family homes were down only 3%. The pandemic has caused some supply chain disruptions in different industries with concrete and lumber. And we're going to see that and talk about that when we go over business and industry as a sector as well. But the prices in concrete and lumber have increased nonetheless. We expect continued regional differences. And so Los Angeles County, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, when this first struck and we did our forecast, we were looking at the potential worst case scenario. We were hearing from the mayor of Los Angeles talking about shutting down construction in LA, which is a major region, LA County. And we had forecast a really dire um, picture there at the beginning, and that just hasn't taken place. We do continue to expect regional differences as we move forward. And as I mentioned, again, this industry recovered the quickest and back to 1819 levels in 1920. 
So now we'll move on to business and industry here. And, and this industry has um, it performed a little bit better than what we also anticipated at the beginning. And we'll go over the reasons why the actual 1920 performance in business and industry ended the year 3.6% down from 1819 fiscal year. The projection as we analyze this third quarter 20, we had forecast a 10% drop and the actual ended up at 5.2%, so a little bit better than what we had forecast. And one thing to remember here is we've talked about it when we've done these webinars with you, but we want to remind you because this business type fulfillment centers is becoming more and more significant. So the figures that you see here, the negative 5.2% do not include business type 97, which is fulfillment centers, and it doesn't include the business type 81, which is energy and utilities. If statewide, if included, especially with the fulfillment centers, overall this sector business improvement in the third quarter would have been up, was up 4%. So really significant swing, 9% plus swing from those two business types. Fulfillment centers themselves grew 95% in the third quarter of 20 and now are accounting for 16% of the sector. And when we get to the next chart, I'll show you that um, visually, you can see the growth. In terms of California industrial base within this sector, primarily computers and electronics, chemicals, food and beverages, aerospace, other transportation equipment and petroleum. Their current credit safe analysis finds that these particular industries are 42% risk of failure. So we may continue to see some downturn in this industry and that's consistent with our forecast. So we look at the next two quarters, we have projected an 8% drop in business and industry as a whole, and then that's statewide, 8% and then 6% in first quarter 20. And then we begin to see a rebound in the second quarter of 21. And that's pretty consistent as Bobby mentioned. And as we talk about our overall forecast, we're looking at middle of 21, the summer months and early fall before we see a turn around in most industries and in the consensus forecast as a whole. And this, in terms of our forecast for business and industry, we're anticipating vaccine distributions. Bobby mentioned this, and they are out on the street now, but we are forecasting, building into our forecast that's not gonna be complete until middle of summer, early fall, 2021. Further federal bailouts, we have not incorporated into our forecast. We don't know, um, we're uncertain whether that will happen at this time. We have the most recent one at the end of December now, and we'll see if that has a positive impact in the fourth quarter of 20 and first quarter of 21, because the, the thing that's coinciding with these vaccine distributions is the virus, the number of cases continues to grow right now. So we'll have to, determine that as we go forward because our forecast is built snapshot, as you know, a snapshot point in time, and we will be continuing to monitor the impact of COVID as we go forward. Production is moving back into the United States and we are projecting a future significant investment in automation, which will help this overall sector. Local agencies, will experience an array of results based on the businesses that are in your agency, the makeup, and we as principals working with you and your team must adjust your forecast accordingly. In terms of the outlook here, the index for new orders is moving forward positively, but the manufacturer's reports, and this was at the time we did the forecast, showed reduced capacity to produce due to COVID-19 related absenteeism, qualified worker shortages, sanitation protocols, inventory and imported parts delivery issues. These are all factors contributing to hurting this particular industry. We now, we've just recently received a December report that indicates expansion in this industry. Manufacturing registered up 3.2% from November. So they're monitoring this, measuring it, quarter by quarter. And when we do our forecast, we're typically, we're looking at 
comparing the quarter that we're in, like we're talking about third quarter 20 to third quarter 19. The manufacturing studies are looking at month to month, but that most recent study has shown expansion in this industry for the eighth consecutive month. And, and that was after when COVID first struck and after contracting in March and April and May for the first time in hundreds of months before that. Full recovery in this industry is not anticipated to begin until the second half of 2021 and if or when the vaccines become widely available and, and uh, take effect in containing the virus. There, the story here, there was an initial first quarter and second quarter 20 surge in computers and communication equipment as students were home um, participating in school and everyone was working from home. There were a lot of one time purchases that helped out and that facilitated these at home initiatives. And we expect that to level off with further declines in tax receipts from industrial machinery equipment, fabricated metal products and manufacturers serving food processing and the petroleum industries. Some gains are projected from companies that are serving logistics, construction, transportation, and agricultural segments. And as the case, we're going to mention it again, but we're talking about every major industry group. Each jurisdiction's experience will differ depending on the specific character and the size, and in this case, the size of the individual business and industrial tax base in your agency. Full recovery, full economic recovery is anticipated in this industry in fiscal year 22-23. And this slide is the one I mentioned showing you the dramatic growth in fulfillment centers over the last five years and to the point where we needed to put together a slide to show you. We likely will continue showing you this either in, in the packets or in the consensus forecast that we do here with you every quarter. And it's now, it accounts for 16.4% in the third quarter of the entire business and industry sector and accounting for two and a half percent of the statewide local tax. So really a significant business type within business and industry. And it grew 95% just in third quarter 20 compared to third quarter 19. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Bobby. And he's gonna talk about food and drugs. Great, <clears throat> thanks Brett. Um, food and drugs. So um, as we talked about and showed earlier, much smaller group overall. The, uh, the group includes grocery stores, liquor and convenience stores, hint, hint, and uh, now also retail cannabis merchants. And so what, uh, what you see there uh, through the uh, most recent three quarters at the, uh, at the top left, 11% uh, growth in 1Q20 is shelter in place, the run on toilet paper at grocery stores, uh, all helped uh, really contribute uh, to that. Then in even in 2Q, continued growth as restaurants um, had been closed and much more dining at home, buying from the grocery store. Um, and then in third quarter, we saw it take another jump up, 11% uh, growth over third quarter 2019. Um, as part of the bullet points there, you can see that grocery stores increased uh, 7%, have increased 7% as a part of 3Q. Uh, cannabis, the cannabis category and really retail cannabis um, boosted 62% gains over the prior year. And it's really twofold. Um, one of the uh, more maybe obvious but interesting aspects when you go back and you look through the great recession uh, liquor stores never decreased they only increased through that so as we imagined um, here through the pandemic shelter uh, in place stay at home um, alcohol sales continue to go up but cannabis as well also the um, now increased number of agencies allowing retail cannabis within their jurisdiction uh, helps contribute. So it's new tax revenue coming in uh, overall that uh, that helps with that 62% growth uh, in third quarter. Um, another interesting fact is that um, overall cannabis is making up 11% of the food and drug category. So much like uh, you heard Brett talk about online sales, 
as a part uh, or fulfillment centers as a part of BNI and business and industry. Uh, here, uh, we're always kind of fascinated by cannabis as a as a subset. Um, as you can see, the forecast, the quarterly forecast going out um, with much more people eating uh, and dining for the holidays, uh, both Thanksgiving and um, uh, uh, Christmas and other um, religious holidays during the December month. Uh, we anticipate growth there to be 10%. And then getting back into something maybe a little bit more steady and normal in the 3% uh, range as we go out. Um, there will be some rebalancing that'll take place, especially compared to prior years where grocery stores may decrease as restaurants reopen, but we really then look to cannabis and uh, the continued um, expansion of allowance within jurisdictions to uh, to probably make up a bigger, uh, a bigger piece of what might lo be lost from uh, grocery stores. So even though it is the smallest category overall uh, within the state, it's uh, it could still be kind of fun to talk about and see uh, see some of the trends that are going on uh, underneath there. So uh, so we don't we don't anticipate. You know, obviously, there hasn't been any tapering uh, any impacts from COVID, and we only see growth for the food and drugs industry. On to um, the next couple of. Uh, major industry groups that have been really impacted by uh, COVID and the uh, uh, shelter in place and complete change in um, in how we function as uh, as a society. Fuel and service stations, as you see at the top left again, the decreases that have been experienced uh, by quarter, uh, much bigger 46% and 31% decreases recently. Um, you can kind of put everything into that that we know, which is the reduction of commuters working from home, not having to um, to go into a, a workplace. Fuel and service stations within the major metropolitan areas has have really been impacted because of that. And we've seen it so tangibly um, in many of our um, more housing communities and inland uh, communities. Uh, we may not see the same percentage decreases. Um, it's we're going to feel it more in the major metropolitan and where uh, folks were um, uh, were going to in into work. Um, also, the demand for airline travel and the need for jet fuel, which um, inevitably funnels back into this category for some of your jurisdictions that have airports. Um, obviously, that's taking a major hit and um, will likely also then have a longer recovery period. Um, even through the summer uh, for this category, um, the hit here, if you will, the inevitable recovery, we don't expect it to get back to 1819 uh, fiscal year numbers until 2025, 26. So a much longer um, uh, recovery effort to, uh, to get back to where the overall uh, category has been much slower. And uh, an airline and future airline travel play a big part of that. Coming up in these next couple of quarters, you can see for fourth quarter, we're anticipating still a 30% drop and 1Q a 10% drop. Um, global inventory of crude oil is, uh, is still pretty elevated. Um, and so we don't anticipate global crude oil prices to, uh, to jump up. Uh, very quickly. The um, the demand is still going to be low as we uh, expect for fourth quarter and um, not as many businesses reopening their um, their offices. Many city halls as we continue to talk with clients are now um, just kind of kicking forward to right around July 1 anticipating the workforce to be back uh, fully back into city halls. Um, so a lot continued remote working. Um, when we hit the summer periods and you see 2Q and 3Q, it's again more compared to the declines that we saw in the prior years um, versus a complete reopening of the economy here. Um, we uh, It was very interesting for us as we analyzed data and, and the results out of the second quarter especially because many of them were double digits and, and high double digits. When we forecast forward, it was pretty amazing that once you get right around that 50% mark, the um, just to get back level, not even a, a recovery as you need, 
almost you know 70 percent rebound just to kind of um, uh, offset or or start offsetting the decreases uh, of that amount so um, here we see those percentages be you know um, a little bit exaggerated if you will because of that effect um, and what it takes to get get the dollars back but um, inevitably during the summer months hopefully there's um, there's more travel and that'll be more local travel rather than airline travel um, which will help the overall consumption of uh, of gas uh, especially for um, the uh, the tourist heavy tourist type agencies on the coast um, you know kind of more of a regional area uh, expect people to get start getting back out and then eventually we'll get the increase in uh, gas prices at the pump that uh, that we all pay um, but uh, but again it'll it'll take us more time and these percentages really reflect the decreases that uh, that we've seen <clears throat> most recently next category is general consumer goods um, here we're really thinking brick and mortar stores so keep that in perspective not so much the online and we see the impacts there for the last three quarters um, as 2Q settled in at just about 40% decline, even 3Q only being down 12% is comparable to what we saw in 1Q, which as that reminder, you know, 1Q was really only impacted for about two weeks. Um, that's the, uh, the late, you know, mid to late March period. A two week period within a quarter represents about 15 to 16%. So we kind of put it in perspective, right? 1Q, we had a uh, still solid January, February activity. When we compare that then to 3Q, it's what we saw was relative to that two week period shutdown overall. So um, last quarter, we were projecting third quarter to be down 18% overall, and we only saw 12. So much better than we were anticipating before, like many of the categories and Brett has already mentioned. Um, some of those, you know, we bullet pointed here on the on the left where apparel county uh, apparel categories continue to struggle, um, especially in mall type locations that uh, that haven't been fully reopened in many jurisdictions uh, for some, especially the rural parts of the, the state. Um, they may have never even closed, but uh, obviously more of uh, the results come uh, when we uh, when we factor in the, the major metropolitan areas. Electronics have shifted away from brick and mortars um, to uh, to online, and uh, whether that's Apple, who most recently had said that they are temporarily closing down their California locations as um, the case volume and case uh, cases have increased. Um, also, Best Buy uh, is uh, those you know brick and mortar locations have been impacted. Uh, foot traffic and it's. It can be a little bit of a tell, but we expect foot traffic to be uh, to be down, um, especially compared to a year ago when there were no, were no COVID impacts in the economy it was cruising right along. Um, discount department stores continue to gain market share. It's a one stop shop. We had seen this all along there. Uh, the Costco's, the Walmart's, the Target's, Sam's Club not as impacted with online competition as we had previously seen, especially out of the sporting goods stores, the specialty stores. Um, many of those, you know, pre-COVID uh, were impacted by online competition, but discount department stores, there's going to be a lot of resiliency there, um, especially when it comes to volume shopping. Just can't get that same uh, same effect online. So, uh, so certain pieces will, uh, we anticipate, will continue to to increase and i think this is a major category that uh, will be impacted by future price increases cpi adjustments or just otherwise inflation on our economy because of um, how we had run so hot prior to uh, covid impacts having such a dramatic impact uh, this is a category where even if there's less bought if it's bought for a higher dollar we might still see um, it uh, sees some modest gains uh, relative to uh, to the prior years. 
As Brett pointed out, with discretionary income and recreational vehicles on the auto side, especially boats and motorcycles, uh, not too surprising overall, we have seen sporting goods um, within this category uh, do really well during the summer months. Um, folks were getting out, buying bicycles and other exercise equipment, um, but that we do anticipate will taper off as the weather changes. And if we, uh, the likelihood this summer, again, kind of factoring in that idea or that concept that uh, uh, the vaccine will help uh, our, uh, our ability to get out, uh, may not have obviously as much of a need for as much sporting equipment as we had these past two quarters. One other chart that we've been kind of tracking again on a um, just for perspective purposes, this this next slide here uh, comes from a website called tracktherecovery.org, where um, you can see there's uh, there's different um, um, universities and different businesses and and others that are grabbing data to uh, to help really kind of show what's going on maybe in more real time. It's not a perfect uh, comparison for your uh, for your local jurisdiction and the forecast that we do, but it is a place where we've been able to gather a little bit of, okay, how are we doing most recently before we get sales tax data uh, compared to the most recent quarters? And so um, just some footnotes or some disclaimers here that we've noticed within this data set all of the percentages, and especially those that you see on the right side of the, the screen here, they compare to January 2020. It's not compared to uh, the prior period uh, pre-pandemic. It's just uh, exclusively, but it is January. And you do then, for the visual side, you see the drop-off that occurred during uh, their late March and, and through April. And the three categories that we, we have here on the screen are retail, <coughs> restaurants, and then entertainment and recreation um, uh, separate from restaurants. Within a lot of our, within our major industry uh, groups and, and what um, Brett will be talking about next with restaurants, we combine those, but here um, they've got it broken out. So it just allows us to kind of see how things have trended. And um, it's been a, it's, Another data set, another fascinating point for us to, to really kind of grab hold and say, okay, how, how do we think we're doing? Um, especially, um, we'll be watching it as the latest data comes in for what was happening during the last couple of weeks in December uh, to really kind of then round out that holiday shopping period. But, uh, but it's been a nice comparison. You can see how, especially that uh, top line there, as we were just talking about, general consumer goods, how overall spending there has uh, um, really kind of rebounded since the, the initial shutdown period and with the, uh, with the stimulus helping the overall economy. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Brett to, uh, to bring us home with, uh, with restaurants and, and going forward. Thank you, Bobby. And this particular industry group along with one that Bobby just talked about, fuel and service stations has been really hit the hardest during COVID and just hammered in terms of the overall impact. And you can see for, for fiscal year 1920, we experienced overall statewide almost a 15% decline. So once again, the economy was going strong for the first two quarters of fiscal year 1920, everyone was happy. We were able to report really good news to all of you. And then COVID struck and first quarter, half of the quarter and the full quarter in the second and had a negative impact overall of almost 15%, 14.7% down for the entire fiscal year. Third quarter 20 now, um, we had projected pretty dire forecast for restaurants and hotels at a 36% drop. And the actual was very close to that, a little bit better at 33%. And we're continuing for the next two quarters to forecast a negative hit to this industry. It's going to take a long time for the overall industry to recover once COVID is done. The fourth quarter 20 forecast is for a 35% 
drop and then an additional quarter drop in first quarter of 21 of 9%. And then we start to see that rebound that Bobby's talking about that second quarter 21 when it coincides with a comparison of second quarter 20, which was the brunt of COVID, the biggest impacted quarter. And so we see a natural rebound just related to that. And then the economy is starting to pick back up. It's coinciding with that middle of 21. So 51% increase in the second quarter of 21 and then ongoing pretty significant increases as we head out into fiscal year 21-22. All of 21-22 then statewide, we have projected a 26.5% increase. So we are seeing, beginning to see a rebound in that industry. The increased COVID surge in November and December sparked another shelter in place in this particular industry. And it was implemented in early December for many regions. So we get a lot of questions from you guys about, um, does this forecast take into account another spark or surge in COVID? And it's, my answer has been, it's been primarily an ongoing surge as we've gone forward. But then now with the shelter, additional shelter in place at toward the end of December, we are, you know, and this forecast is a snapshot in time. We, we got together, we did our consensus forecast about four weeks ago. So it's that snapshot in time, but we definitely monitor this as we go forward. And so the additional restrictions may have an impact and especially as we analyze your individual jurisdiction in the fourth quarter of 20 and on into the first quarter of 21 and maybe even worse than what we have in the forecast right now so we'll make sure we monitor that we'll we'll dialogue with you in your particular city and or agency and make sure that we're as accurate as we can be um, there are additional restrictions the no outdoor dining in most of the regions have now gone back to the purple level, which means restaurants that were allowing up to 25% capacity sit down in the casual dining business type category now are have to take that away. So there's zero being allowed indoor. And now with the governor's order, there is not supposed to be any outdoor dining, but many regions and you see individual restaurants as you drive around, are not enforcing that order. I think maybe restaurants are taking a chance that either they're gonna close, if they if they close up, they're gonna fold. And so they're taking a chance that they, the enforcement won't take place. But you've seen some of that still happening with the outdoor dining. The quick service and fast, fast casual segments, which are business types in this industry group, are doing much better than the full service, sit down, casual dining, fine dining type of restaurants. And the reasons they're better set up with the drive throughs and mobile order technology than most of the established full service restaurants. And the other part is the change in consumer habits that Bobby talked about it with food and drugs. And so as people are not eating out and they're eating at home, they're either buying groceries. And so the grocery stores, which are within food and drugs category are doing really well, or they're getting in their new vehicle, if they happen to purchase a new vehicle and or not, just their whatever vehicle and going to the drive-through and or picking up fast food and bringing that home. So those quick service type restaurants, fast casual, have helped insulate the overall drop that has been seen as this industry has just been hammered. So they've done a little bit better and we talk about that with, with each of you when we meet with you on a quarterly basis and look at your your quick service restaurants and see how they're doing to help you offset so another insulation type um, the year over year declines in seated diners steadily increased through august and peaked in september through october dining and entertainment spending remains significantly below levels seen in january 2020 and the regional differences that were we talked about that in the building and construction industry. We're seeing that also in restaurants and hotels. We've seen that in second quarter and third quarter results with Bay Area continuing to be impacted harder than the state average and the far north, Sacramento, San Joaquin Valley regions are typically doing better. So if we go to the next one, 
we put this particular slide in here the last couple of quarters when we did the webinar and we would like to continue to to put it up there as an example of creative use of space and cities have come up with creativity to use public rights of way i think it's been fantastic allowing outdoor spaces so restaurants can continue to operate and it's been a factor in helping to offset the overall reduction in the category and the good news is um, recently california restaurant association have were successful in challenging some of the restrictions in the outdoor options so that's going to help the possibility of continuing this i know many of you when we talk to you your individual agencies are happy that this may continue on into the future in terms of the the outlook for the industry health regulations over the past nine months have created overwhelming challenges for the hospitality industry and this has impacted hotels travel airlines entertainment and it's really hit the restaurants hard so an uptick in travel is not expected it's not incorporated into our forecast until spring and it may take years to reach the pre-pandemic levels full economic recovery in this industry is not anticipated until 23 24 at this point in time so now we go on to one of the last groups of so the last group that we're going to talk about we kind of save the very positive news bobby's hit on this um, in the overview at the front and we're talking about we have three different slides here to talk about how the pools have changed and the, what the performance of the pools has been this particular chart shows how the pools have changed over just the last three years and we're talking about time period third quarter 17 to third quarter 20 comparison the pools are now heavily made up of retail goods and that's due to the shift of online shopping and AB 147, which was the legislation that was implemented as part of the Wayfair decision. And so you can see the shift there and general consumer goods, business and industry neck and neck in terms of one and two um, within the pools themselves as industry groups. So Bobby talked about general consumer goods point of sale sales here we're talking about general consumer goods in the pool and online sales so the next chart here is showing a 13 quarter trend and it's demonstrating the growth impacts that wayfair from ab 147 has had on the countywide pools and the marketplace facilitator portion of the legislation which was implemented december of 2019 full implementation in the fourth quarter and the other part of it was the out-of-state retailers that were required to report and remit into the pool back in april of 2019 those two pieces and implemented as part of ab 147 since the implementation at the end of fourth quarter of 2019 the pools have averaged a growth of over 30 percent per quarter so you can see that dramatic difference there before and after AB 147 definitely having a really significant and permanent increase on the pools that we've built into the forecast the large gains it's also relative to new money and a lot of this is COVID spending and it's being inflated during COVID so people are at home they have that discretionary income and they're making it in terms of online purchases and that's happening now we see that stabilizing as we head into the future now the last one that we have here on the pools shows the growth over a period of time and we ended the year overall in fiscal year 1920 at 20 percent increase and so once again this has covid included in two of those quarters and in spite of that the pools and possibly partly because of that, the pools significantly grew. So you have Wayfair implemented at the end of 2019. You have COVID then striking in March right after that. 1920 really benefited 20% um, increase. And we've continued to revise our forecast upward in the pools themselves, trying to stay conservative, but also trying to be realistic following where the trend is going and where we forecast it going. And third quarter 20, we had projected a 25% increase. And in this is the quarter that we're analyzing for you. We're going to meet with you. And the really good news here is third quarter 20, the actual increase was over 44%, 44.4% for that particular quarter. And ongoing increases, we have 
fourth quarter with the holiday season, we're projecting a 20% increase and then an additional 10% increase in the first quarter and then some stabilization. As I mentioned, once we're going to start coming out of COVID, we will see some normalization in the pool increases and but we are still projecting long term average increase of 6% annually all the way out to 25, 26. And that is similar to the pre Wayfair levels. So that's the story. Pools are number one, number two or number three group in almost every agency that we analyze now. And that definitely was not the case five years back, 10 years back. So positive story that's helping all of you, all of the agencies during COVID. And we're projecting that out into the future as well. Very good news. And this just quickly give you an update on the deferral program. It's becoming and I, and I saw one of the questions that we've received. Do we have an update on the deferral? And this is it. We have it's become less and less of a story. When we started COVID in the first quarter of 20, we had given you a projection and it was pretty significant. The number of businesses that took advantage of the governor's executive program, the first executive program allowing businesses with a million and less in sales to defer their sales payment into the next quarter. So that went from first quarter to second quarter. And in the first quarter, roughly 14% of first quarter 20 local tax was deferred. And then in the second quarter, what came in there was $207 million funded with second quarter that came in related to the first quarter. So 14% in the first quarter, then the second quarter when we met with you last quarter, it was roughly 3% of the second quarter local tax was deferred, which 51 million was funded in the second quarter um, from the third quarter sales. So it's becoming less and less. And now as we're meeting with you this quarter, less of a story based on the estimated payments in the third quarter, we're projecting 31 million likely deferred from the third quarter 20, about 2% of the total. Less of a story still reflected in your missing payments that will be in your packet again this quarter. The only thing that may impact this is if the surge of the coronavirus has a significant impact on um, pushing revenues down in fourth quarter and in first quarter of 21, then more businesses may take advantage of the program again. So we'll analyze that one quarter at a time. The program is still eligible. Businesses are eligible to take advantage of the deferral for the next two quarters. The good news here though is it's less of an impact in the third quarter. So it's a cash impact really only. It's not a fiscal impact and it's staying within your fiscal year 2021. So that's really where we are with the deferral program. And now just we're getting ready. We'll take the questions and answer those. And just to quickly wrap up, um, COVID-19 struck back in March of 2020 and the world's economy began to slide. The full brunt we've talked about was felt in the second quarter with the shelter in place requirements. We've been in this pandemic now for more than three quarters and really fourth quarter 20 and on into first and second quarter of 21. And the story has been a combination of significant hits on restaurants and hotels and fuel and service stations that we talked about. Travel related businesses really significantly hit and this has been offset by very strong growth in the countywide and statewide use tax pools. So we're continuing to monitor COVID-19 and the state's economy and other factors too. I saw a question there related to, are we just analyzing the impact of COVID before and after? Or are we taking other factors into account? And we definitely will and continue to take other factors into account and if necessary modify our overall forecast like we had to do that in the first quarter of 20 we had to modify when COVID struck we modified our forecast two different times and continued to re reduce it downward we typically don't do that it's a snapshot in time but we will continue to monitor COVID impacts and other impacts like um, you know the the president transitional time period that's coming up here too and if there's any significant impacts. The need to slow and contain the virus is really the key here to settling the upheaval in our local economy and since the vaccine's been introduced we've talked about we're 
building into our forecast anticipation middle of the year next year so summer and on into the fall when that vaccine will begin to stabilize and hopefully bring down the overall surge of cases and we'll monitor your budgets we'll individually tailor them to your agencies and please feel free to call us or email us anytime that you have any questions as always we'll we'll take any of us will take your your questions and we really look forward to working with you and and wish you really strong financial health and health overall from this time period that we're dealing with. We appreciate all of the work that you guys do to help us help you. So we'll now take any questions. Bobby and I will go through and answer the questions that have been submitted today during the presentation. Yeah, um, so I started publishing uh, some of the questions and uh, a couple of responses that I had um, to those questions already, just a um, couple of them of like, will the slides be available after the presentation? We will make them available uh, along with the video. It'll be posted on our website. Uh, as soon as we can turn it around from a technical standpoint, we'll make that available to you. Um, and then also, the, I think the first one you see here as far as published, uh, the fourth quarter increases based on the change from third quarter or from fourth quarter 19. All of the comparisons that we have are to the prior year, same quarter, um, just so that we get a sense because of that seasonality effect of sales tax. We really want to kind of make sure that we're comparing um, same time periods with uh, with prior years. Um, Brett, we could probably just kind of go down the list here and uh, and take these. Um, as you made reference, there was a question. Uh, uh, that I published here, much consideration to these economic impacts due to COVID and anticipated post-COVID recovery. Any consideration for climate change, uh, which was our pre-COVID concern, and or future political turmoil and social justice issues. Um, it's a, uh, a very big question. I'll go ahead and take this one, but it's very big and broad. Um, there, especially the uh, pol future political turmoil and social justice issues that have been uh, so tangible for us. Um, I would say for many of the agencies that I specifically looked at during the um, uh, the protests that happened mainly during you know kind of the May June time period into July, um, we really didn't see as big of an impact specifically related to uh, uh, to those protests. And then as you saw the third quarter results be better than the second quarter, um, appears that, OK, maybe they didn't have a lasting impact. Um, obviously, with what we've seen over the last uh, yesterday, <laughs> I was going to say the last couple of days, but really it's just yesterday in Washington, D.C., um, and then start to kind of play out. Um, we don't know yet. Um, it's obviously why we wanted a peaceful, everybody wanted a peaceful transition of power and why we've, uh, as a society um, counted on it over all of our uh, uh, decades and centuries or years that, that we've been around. Um, we can't yet factor that in. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be. There are aspects, and I think Brett touched on them earlier, there are aspects of a new administration that we did decide to kick in. Um, you know, the increase from $600 of um, uh, tax rebates to $2,000, um, we hadn't yet as a part of this forecast really factored that in because it came kind of late there in December. Um, and so, I could, but I can say that as we reached out and talked with everybody during the second quarter, and we saw those results not be as bad and dire as we originally thought. As a part of the second quarter was the initial um, increase in tax or the initial tax refund and then the increase in unemployment benefits that we couldn't uh, so tangibly see in the data, but we know that it's built in there, help those results be better than what we were forecasting. I think we could all sit around and say that if there's a $2,000 check that comes out to the majority of uh, of our communities, that uh, that, that will help um, add you know, sales tax dollars back into uh, what will be 1Q21, um, and then maybe even help us as we uh, progress towards uh, the summer months, which we were already anticipating to be um, better and uh, a little bit more growth built in there. That larger question of climate change, um, 
it's it's there. We uh, I can't I can't say that we have any tangible aspects to say this is what uh, specifically climate change will do for our economy, both positively or negatively. On the auto front, I think we could sit here and um, and look at the increase of electric vehicle sales, especially with with Tesla. Uh, but every major brand is working in that direction. Um, the and California's own kind of uh, uh, legislative mark or or uh, pin of hey, we're going to stop selling gas vehicles. Um, things like that may eventually have. Um, you know, a, an increase in spending as we transition over. But I don't think we can really pin that one down to say, you know, here's what it would be and, and how it's going to impact us uh, or impact sales tax. Yeah, uh, a couple yeah. of questions on the deferrals, which I, I think we that was mm -hmm. those were posted before we gave the overview of the deferrals. And yes, there have been additional rounds of deferrals the program is available for the next couple of quarters for businesses to take advantage. And I mentioned that if there is additional surge, which negatively, more negatively impacts fourth quarter 20 and first quarter 21 than what we have forecast, then it is possible that more businesses will take advantage of the deferral programs because those programs are available to them. Yeah. And the um, one of those that uh, that I think I um, I posted, and um, now I'm kicking myself for for posting a bunch because I have to scroll through and find them. But it's um, oh uh, from Danielle Garcia. Any idea why businesses did not participate in larger numbers in the deferral programs offered by the state, and why was the program not as popular as anticipated? Um, I think it's uh, a combination there. One, we have to identify the expectations um, or the anticipation. When the governor's executive order originally came out, the spreadsheets that we put on the website and that we had kind of used as our um, marker for what uh, could be eligible for deferral was really us um, kind of looking at all eligible businesses, right? And so we were trying to, to be conservative and really get that. For it to come in under, um, maybe it wasn't necessarily a surprise um, initially. So it's just kind of like, okay, we were we were kind of shooting for everything, and and not everybody needed it. I think that's the part there where um, businesses, as they were, so the first quarter affected was first quarter, and because we had the economic shut shutdown and the shelter in place at the end of March. The entire month of April, businesses really didn't know what to expect out of the future economy. And so while they were, you know, that month was when they were filing that first quarter return, the January, February, March sales period, tax returns get filed in, a, in April. I think by the time we hit second quarter, or they hit second quarter, they started to see how they could change their business to have some activity, to have some sales. And thereby, when they were filing the second quarter, the, um, the April, May, June time period, they were filing in July. At that point, they pretty much knew how this was going to play out and how their businesses were going to be impacted. They probably didn't need uh, to take advantage of the deferrals. They didn't need to just wait to pay it because they had it. Uh, to be honest, I, I think I have a, uh, some confidence that businesses know that's not their money, even though you know, the, the governor gave them a, a chance to hold on to that cash. It's really not theirs. They got to remit it at some point. And so they knew then, OK, here's our business. Here's what it's going to be. Let me just go ahead and get caught up on my uh, on my remittances and get those uh, get those paid. So um, and then, you know, what we saw in the third quarter, we're kind of more back to normal of businesses will always may always miss the filing period, but we definitely don't see it because of the deferral program. I think that's what takes a little bit of steam out of this latest executive order by the governor and our anticipation that, OK, businesses know what they're what they're in for or, or how they could uh, what their sales might be. Uh, they may not have as great of cash concerns and need to hold on to that, uh, that sale, those sales tax dollars to get them through. So hopefully that helps answer uh, that part of the deferral question. 
And one of the questions on here is the 4Q20 increase based on the change from 3Q20 or 4Q19. And our forecasts, we've talked about it. We look at the comparable quarter one year earlier. So it 4Q20 is looking at a comparison of 4Q19. Yeah, I already, I think I got that on. Um, let's see. So. TOT, um, there's a question that uh, that's here. Um, if TOT directly isn't mentioned, can you please briefly provide your assumptions on TOT revenue, uh, TOT revenue recovery? Um, TOT, by all accounts, so uh, part of our part of HDL, um, we do have tax and fee administration for both business license and uh, transient occupancy tax, where um, we have cities that um, use our website, allow the customers to use the website to remit their sales, ta their sorry, their TOT revenue and business license revenue uh, online, pay it online, and then we end up facilitating the back end of it. So we've seen some of that activity already, and it uh, depends on the community. So if your community and your hotels were really based around business travel, um, there's going to be a longer recovery, as you heard us talk about, whether it's fuel and service stations and travel, or um, you know just tourism. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, probably a longer road to recovery on the TOT side. But if your jurisdiction um, is maybe a little bit more desirable for the uh, com not so much commuters, but local local residents or communities coming inland towards the towards the ocean because they just want to get away from the house. Um, we had seen their TOT revenue initially drop off, but then recover um, and, and start to stabilize. And so it's, it's largely agency dependent. Uh, so really think about who and, and what activity. Talk to your hotelers to, uh, to get that sense of, okay, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? Uh, how were they structured before? What were they counting on? And uh, and you might then be able to kind of uh, get an idea of how it's going to trend going forward. The other thing to take into account with TOT is the price of rooms. While many hotels had to uh, block out rooms for overall limited capacity, in some cases the nightly stay went up and if uh, people were really eager to get out and get away, they might be willing to pay those prices which then still makes for fairly good TOT revenue dollars. So um, it's not really part of the sales tax picture, but uh, talk to your hotelers. Um, they, uh, they'll they probably have a lot more information as to how exactly they've been uh, um, impacted and then going to trend out of this. The uh, Another couple of questions are regarding uh, CUTFA's change in allocations. Um, as far as a higher advance payment and a lower cleanup payment, um, is it a permanent change or is there an end date depending on the pandemic? Um, on this one, it uh, has more to do with CDTFA's uh, migration into CROSS, the new reporting system. You re <laughs> reflect back two years when they made that change, it had a huge disruption in cash, monthly cash, and uh, and thereby quarterly cash because um, they had to they had to switch over. Now within the new system, cross they CDTFA's goal here is to actually get you money sooner. Um, as soon as they have money in, they want to be able to give it to you, and so that's the change in the allocation methodology from what so many of us felt as like a warm blanket before of. 30%, 30%, 40%, and then a cleanup. Now um, their goal is to really analyze as they start getting dollars in. So there are a lot of taxpayers who do pay monthly instead of waiting for the quarterly um, filing. So if um, CDTFA has been very cognizant of that, wanting to see if they've got more um, in some of the early months, which are you know kind of that advanced period, they want to be able to pass that along to you and then still reconcile with within the third monthly uh, the, uh, 
the third payment of the quarter, <laughs> the third monthly payment of the quarter. Um, so it's not something that is a, a process that um, we do anticipate to be a permanent change. It's not temporary. Um, it's a methodology and kind of a workload um, change for, for CDTFA. So what our challenge has been, uh, for many of you as clients, you have seen our cash projection report, which then takes the quarterly amount and breaks it into three monthly payments. Um, we're still early in this new allocation methodology to kind of figure out, okay, how do we change our um, monthly forecasting methodology to maybe match up a little bit closer? We hope that we can get there, but it is, um, we don't know exactly how much is being received by CDTFA in any one month to really kind of build that into our model, which, um, you know, it's also could be largely dependent on who the taxpayers are within your jurisdiction. And our methodology within our software is meant to be more, um, you know, system wide, uh, a single methodology rather than customize each one for each agency on that front. For us, in the end, it's still, um, you know, our goal uh, continues to be to try to get the, the total quarterly amount um, close to, uh, to what actually comes in. And then just how that breaks down monthly, uh, we know that it impacts your, your cash flow, but, uh, but our, our kind of goal is to kind of get the data and see if, how close we are on the total quarter. So we're still going to be working and playing with it, trying to, uh, uh, trying to tighten it up for you but um, something that uh, we still all kind of have to work on. Uh, yeah, there's only a couple left, Bobby. I think you answered one of them individually, a suggestion about an improvement, and we will um, take gladly, happily take suggestions that you guys have for us for future webinars, and that's how you have responded to that one, Bobby. So I think we've got that one. Um, so yeah, Brett, so you, I think you're on the new uh, tab. If you go over to publish, that's where um, you've seen ones that I've dropped in over there. <laughs> yes. For our, uh, for our Q and A session. Yeah. Um, so one of them is um, a, a most recent issue that we are tracking very closely. Um, it, uh, the question is, it's my understanding that Amazon is negotiating with CDTFA to change its payment agreements slash structure. Uh, is there any way to know what the changes will entail and what that create, uh, what that, would that create significant reductions in pool of revenue for many districts? Uh, this is an agency that uh, we are uh, working very closely with CDTFA on. Uh, talking with them very frequently because it uh, it could have an impact and we want to make sure that um, we're uh, right there for all of you as uh, listening to uh, what might be coming out of that conversation. Um, we are with the understanding that Amazon has changed its, its structure, its business structure um, previously, and this dates all the way back to 2012, I believe, when they first started collecting. Uh, they had a business structure that kept them um, legally as an out-of-state company and thereby all of their sale, local sales tax dollars, the Bradley Burns normal 1%, goes into the county pool where the goods are delivered. Um, they, uh, they've changed that structure and CDTFA has been having conversations with them to figure out legally does it change the way the local sales tax dollars need to be allocated. Um, we don't have any new information yet. Um, we uh, obviously have run a scenario, uh, multiple scenarios through our heads. Um, yes, they come back to uh, the possibility of a change for how much is allocated to the pools um, and thereby out to your local jurisdictions by way of the pools. But we do not know um, the total dollar impact, and uh, we will uh, be keeping you guys posted uh, as much as as we know from CDTFA. Um, we'll be passing that along and really kind of watching the issue uh, because of what, as Brett pointed out, and, and we all um, kind of acknowledge that Amazon's contribution into the pools, the growth out of the pools, especially with AB 147 and marketplace facilitators, 
that um, that growth has been tremendous and it's really helped a lot of your agencies weather the COVID impact, you know, those direct impacts onto your local, uh, your local businesses and local sales tax that the pool growth has definitely helped. So we're going to continue to watch it and be mindful and um, provide information as, as it becomes available. Um, let's see, when will agency third quarter forecast be available? Um, as we go through the quarter and get ready for our quarterly meetings with you, we um, uh, the individual agency forecast uh, is done usually in advance of the meeting. Um, we're trying to get them all done as quickly as possible. Uh, so keep checking there. If you have a uh, uh, if you if you have a specific interest or want to reach out for a specific date, feel free. Um, many of you have you know kind of a slew of emails for us. Anybody can uh, uh, help you with that timing, um, or at least pass it along and make sure that. Uh, that uh, we get that for you, but um, most notably, it's, it'll come usually. It'll be available usually um, a few days before the meeting that we have set up for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, and, Brett. You want to jump in, or you want me to just? Yeah. Um, fire them off. <laughs> there's not. A, I think we've answered. I'm trying to see. We've answered most of them how do we obtain a list of oh, a specific list of companies who took advantage of the deferral program um, that's primarily in the missing payments report in the packet and that missing payments report also has those taxpayers that truly have missed a payment within the quarter but if they're eligible for the deferral program you're going to see that most of that in that missing payment report we can explain that to you as we meet with you or give you that um, list ahead of time. And um, to that end, there was a second part of the deferral program, which allowed for a longer 12 month deferral. Um, those businesses actually needed to sign up with CDTFA. Um, CDTFA can um, gather who, you know, how many and who for uh, for each agency. Um, but uh, but feel free to to bring those requests through us. Uh, bring it up at the uh, at the quarterly meeting that we have for you and we'll uh, we'll reach out uh, in a greater collective with CDTFA so they could really kind of um, uh, utilize their resources in, a, in a, an efficient way. But feel free to bring it up at your meeting and and we'll help get that for you. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, what do you see coming from the state legislature this coming year? Uh, or in the next few years, is any possible reforms, changes to pool allocations, uh, are changes to the pool allocation off the table in your opinion? And then I believe Marcus uh, has a question here. What do you see coming from the state legislature? Uh, kind of along those same lines. Oh, it was you, Marcus. Um, as you just heard me talk about Amazon and um, what, uh, what changes they might have, um, I think it's uh, that's probably the one of probably going to be the one of the bigger issues that hits the legislature this year. Um, if it, uh, we don't know what the change will be, but uh, we have then guessed if it's a fairly big change, um, it uh, it'll it'll resound pretty loudly for most agencies, and uh, and it's not just local agencies; it's also counties. Uh, as a whole, so um, that we could see here um, very quickly. We do, we are anticipating um, within the next couple of months to really hear how those impacts are gonna are gonna play out um, or changes with Amazon, if any, um, if 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 there are changes, how they're gonna play out, and um, then that's when we'll kind of kick in the uh, the next phase if the changes are big. So um, yeah. It, that's probably the one big legislative uh, concern or focus this year. A couple of years back, you'll recall there was some um, conversations about changing how the pools or how local tax is allocated. Um, instead of going into the county pools, have the tax dollars follow the goods uh, to their destination. So destination sourcing as a concept. And um, that uh, that also came up as a part of 
um, a Senate constitutional amendment proposal and a assembly constitutional um, uh, amendment proposal. Um, they didn't gain much traction at that time, but uh, depending on um, what, if anything happens with Amazon, it, uh, it could, uh, could lead in to a little bit more there. Um, I think the other ones were on the deferral, so hopefully we kind of beat that one in. But it's probably not going to be as as big of an impact. Not we're not anticipating it to be a, a huge concern. Um, anything else? I Have think. See that, Brett? I think we've answered the, all those questions. Okay. Very good, and I'm not seeing uh, too much there. All right. Um, then thank you guys so much for your time. We really appreciate you sticking with us. I know we went over quite a bit there. Uh, hopefully it was good information for you. Again, on a statewide level, um, we are definitely, our whole team is looking forward to coming out and meeting with you this quarter to really go through uh, the latest forecast update that we have, third quarter results and the forecast update that we have for you, knowing that many of you are working on mid-year budget reviews and starting to prepare for fiscal year 21-22. So um, with that, uh, please remain in good health. Um, hopefully everybody is, is healthy and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much.